percent its faculty members must be women who study in the best universities. As the whole university works towards excellence, UPLB's mission of promoting women who will be graduate and research university and contributing to national development shall soon become a reality. <laughs> Academic excellence and knowledge and technologies towards inclusive and an enabling environment that inspires creativity and innovation. These are the people. yung chef sa kung mag may yung practice ka
multitasking tapos isang na tapos si Good afternoon, participants. Can you uh, hear me? Yeah? So, naka... Naka... Uh, mute po kayo lahat. But, uh, we have... Dr. Lapitan is now uh, joining us. Hello, Din Dong. Hello, can you uh, hear me? Uh, okay. We can hear you. Okay, yes. So we'll uh, start. Yes. So welcome. This is the fourth webinar of the graduate school entitled Reimagining Higher and Graduate Education, Business as Usual or New Normal. Our topic today will focus on the perspectives of higher education leaders, deans, and presidents. So the UPLB Graduate School webinar series aims to gather perspectives from education thought leaders and administrators about, about the impacts of COVID-19 global pandemic. Now considered as a game changer, the pandemic continues to reshape almost every sector, with the educational sector as the most 
one of the most hardest hit or severely affected. As a new academic year will be open, we will be rethinking and crafting new teaching and learning in consideration of the issues and challenges brought about by the pandemic. So for instance, will face-to-face -face learning be replaced by flexible, online or remote learning? How will education institutions adapt to new normal in order to mitigate the short and long-term impacts of school closures due to the pandemic? How will universities continue to conduct research and pursue public service and internationalization in a post-COVID-19 scenario? Please join us and share your thoughts as we imagine the state of higher and graduate education in a post-COVID-19 scenario. We acknowledge our guest, Chancellor Fernando C. Sanchez, Jr. Our Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Dr. Portia Lapitan. Our Deans, Dean Bello, Dean Slava, Dean Abasolo, Dean Elipano. And our guests, Dr. Ronquillo and Dr. Ed Fermin. They'll be introduced later. So to kick off this webinar, we are very fortunate to have with us our Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Dr. Portia G. Lapitan. She will deliver the opening remarks. But before I call our Vice Chancellor, let me first congratulate her as recipient together with other co-writers of the NAST Outstanding Book Award. Our Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Dr. Portia Lapitan, for the opening remarks. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Dong, for that advertisement <laughs> about our winning the Outstanding Book Award of the National Academy of Science and Technology. Uh, so this is the second time I will be giving an opening remarks. And so to everybody, good afternoon. And I hope all of us are really safe and healthy because we cannot address the challenges before us in the higher education if we are not healthy. So I hope you know, everybody is taking the necessary precaution and um, upholding the necessary protocols so that we will all be safe and healthy. So once again, good afternoon to everybody. And also I would like to specially uh, greet the chancellor who, who will be with us again in this webinar. Good afternoon, Chancellor Sanchez. And also to the participants, uh, reactors coming from other state universities and colleges, particularly Dr. Ronquillo and Dr. Fermin. I am happy to open an activity like this. And as I've said earlier, this is my second time that I will be opening uh, this particular activity. Uh, it's a very uh, timely activity that UPLB, through the leadership of Chancellor Sanchez, and of course, the initiative of our indefatigable uh, Dean Camacho of the UPLB Graduate School has prioritized above other concerns to address the pressing challenge confronting higher education institutions. UPLB has undertaken academic policy directions even before the ECQ was put in place in the whole of Luzon in mid-March to ensure learning of students will continue despite the threat of COVID-19. As early as the first week of March, Faculty members were asked to revisit their course syllabi so that while physical classes are not happening, students can still continue to avail of the learning from the course and continue to develop the competency the courses are supposed to endow in them. Online classes and other alternative modes of course delivery replace the face-to-face -face classes. But these modalities were constrained when the total lockdown ECQ commenced. With the easing up of ECQ to GCQ and to probably MGCQ, 
when we start the coming academic year 2020-2021, will HEIs as a whole go back to business as usual? The webinar today, as mentioned by Dean Camacho, entitled Reimagining Higher and Graduate Education, Business as Usual or New Normal, which seeks to get the perspectives of educators and students on the impact of COVID-19 on higher and graduate education conducted by a Zoom is very timely and provides a peek into the modality by which mass communication uh, like uh, course delivery will be conducted in the immediate future. This webinar series, the UPLB Graduate School has will expand our understanding of the challenges and opportunities and threats that higher and graduate education were afforded with this pandemic. Uh, I hope that the, this particular webinar will also broaden the resources that we may consider in the new normal. That all of us, not just higher education institutions, confront nowadays. I hope this webinar will be an effective platform for sharing of knowledge, practices, and ideas among HEIs that will be material and useful in deciding and planning the trajectory the higher and graduate education should follow in the situation we were thrust in by COVID-19. The reality is we cannot go back to business as usual. This reality demands us to prepare for the new normal and do everything we can so that we will be able to effectively embrace the new normal. At this point, let me recognize today's panelists and reactors. Uh, Dean uh, Camacho has already mentioned uh, the two very esteemed uh, educators from our sister SUCs, Dr. Tirso Aaron Kildo, the president of the Batanda State University and also the current president of the Philippine Association of State Universities and Colleges. Uh, Dr. Edison A. Fermin, who is the Vice President for Academic Affairs of the National Teachers College, and the four deans of the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, namely Dr. Arnold Elefano, the Dean of the College of Engineering and Agro-Industrial Technology, Dr. Willie Abasolo of the College of Forestry and Natural Resources, Prof. Roland Bellio of the College of Public Affairs and Development, and uh, Dr. Decibel F. Islaba from the School of Environmental Sciences and Environmental Science and Management. Uh, thank you for sharing in this webinar your perspectives of the challenge before us and the initiatives you have undertaken and the programs and activities you have planned for the coming academic year so that we will be able to address the challenges of uh, COVID-19. Thank you to all the participants in the previous webinar. I know many of the participants have contributed uh, their perspectives on, on the matter. So committed as we are in advancing higher education in the Philippines, that's all for our all to taking on the work of delivering the best education in the country, however constraining and limiting the environment and situation may be. I trust all of us are for the good of education in this country and we will do everything so that we will be able to deliver the best education in the country. I would like to commend, of course, Dean Camacho and his team 
for coming up with platforms like this for discussion of uh, activities programs that would benefit higher education. Good afternoon to everybody and may we find the webinar fruitful and useful. Mabuhay tayo lahat. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chancellor Portia Lapitan. We are uh, very fortunate that uh, our Chancellor, Dr. Fernando C. Sanchez Jr. has been joining us since day one of the webinar series. May I call our, our Chancellor, Dr. Fernando C. Sanchez Jr. for his message, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Dong, uh, thank you uh, for uh, this uh, webinar, very important webinar. And uh, this is my, uh, I think, third message. <laughs> so I'll read it. Uh, to the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, uh, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, uh, the beautiful, multi-awarded uh, Professor of the College of Forestry, Dr. Portia Lapitan. Ma'am, congratulations sa inyong uh, uh, award sa uh, National Academy of Science and Technology. Thank you. Of course, uh, to the President of the Philippine Association of State uh, Universities and Colleges, and also President of the Batanga State University, sa, uh, to Dr. Uh, Pierso Roquillo. Good afternoon, sir. sir. Uh, good, good afternoon, afternoon Paul. Okay. To, of course, to the very active dean of the UPLB Graduate School, uh, Dr. Jose Camacho Jr., to the secretary of the UPLB Graduate School, Dr. Emeline Dupo. I also want uh, to congratulate uh, Amy for being uh, one of the 13 2020 ASEAN Outstanding Science Diplomats. So congratulations, congratulations, Amy. And to our webinar panelists, reactors, and participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. So the COVID-19 pandemic has made evident the strengths and weaknesses of many countries, governments, and institutions worldwide. It has also made us realize and question the preparedness of our society to face a crisis of this magnitude. As I said last webinar, we need to come to terms to the fact that things will never be the same for some time. And that there is no getting back to the way things were until a vaccine for COVID-19 is made available for everyone. This, how, however, does not mean that we should stop from living our lives, fulfilling our duties and seeking ways to achieve our goals. Many higher educational institutions in our country are in many ways experiencing the same set of challenges and difficulties brought about by COVID-19. Well, there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution to this new slew of challenges. I believe that we can all agree that as members of the academy, it is paramount that we truly open ourselves to change and learn to quickly adapt to change. For the new normal necessitates not just new ways of doing, but also new ways of thinking. That is why it is important that we rethink a new way of life in the education sector. New systems and new methods, new principles and worldview without neglect, neglecting our standards and our advocacies. And while we continue to be vigilant in preventing the further spread and damage of COVID-19, we must persist in finding ways to ensure the improvement of our instruction, research, and public service activities, while attending to the new needs of our students, faculty members, and staff. This is our duty to our fellow Filipinos. This is our duty as higher education administrators, as members of the academe, and as educators. Flexible learning, or what I also like to call 
Education 4.0 is also a new way of life in the education sector that can be empowering for both teachers and students. It also allows teachers to explore and use an extensive range of teaching utilities, technologies, and strategies through adaptive distance or online learning, modular or individualized instruction, project-based or blended learning, and other alternative delivery modes. It also allows students to select how, what, when, and where they learn at their own pace and own place. Furthermore, Education 4.0 is mutually beneficial for both students and the teacher since it reduces health and security risks of traditional face-to-face -face education. Education 4.0 can also develop students and graduates that are not only experts in their respective fields of specialization, but also in utilizing information, communication technologies, a skill that is expected to be a staple of the new normal and the future. Education 4.0 is and will be the new normal. Flexible learning, aptly referred to as remote learning in the UP system, may appear unideal for many. It is admittedly not perfect for now, but it is the learning modality of the future. And I and it will get better. And arguably, the COVID-19 pandemic is the compelling catalyst that flexible learning needs to achieve its full potential. Thus, I want to emphasize to everyone in this webinar that flexible learning is not and should not be treated as a temporary response to the COVID-19 crisis, but rather a permanent necessity for higher education in the Philippines. As such, it is my hope that this webinar will serve as a platform to encourage members of the academe to change the way they regard flexible learning and also help in laying the foundations and developing a more resilient and proactive higher education in our country. We need to do this. We really need to do this. This is because as members of the academe and as educators, it is our duty to safeguard our country's higher education its institutions and the institutions that rely on it, not only from pandemics, but also from many other challenges that await us in the future. It is a tall order, but it is something that we really need to do. And we really need to start preparing for the future. Because if there is anything that the current COVID-19 crisis has taught us is that none of us, none of us knew that we will find ourselves in this situation in 2020. That said, I thank everyone for taking the time to participate in this webinar. We look forward to your contributions in transforming, safeguarding, and future-proofing higher education in our country. COVID-19 may have made our lives hard and radically different for the foreseeable future. However, despite the challenges that COVID-19 brings, as in any crisis, Filipinos have always proven to rise to the occasion. We pull ourselves, our resources together to respond and extend our help to where it is needed the most. Let us all work together in making a proactive and resilient Philippine higher education. Maraming salamat at mabuhay po tayo. Magandang hapon po, Chancellor. Salamat po. And uh, thank you for uh, sharing us uh, the direction that the university uh, will uh, be taking and uh, will be uh, preparing. Thank you very much uh, for saying the fact that uh, we are all one here, that nobody is expert. Uh, we're all caught unaware, 
and we must all work together. Maraming pong salamat at Chancellor for that inspiring uh, message. Thank you, Don, and congratulations to your team. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, uh, we are uh, we are joined by about 400 uh, registered participants. Many are from state universities and colleges from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. So numerous to mention. I hope I have uh, time to mention all the uh, institutions uh, represented here, the universities uh, represented here. Thank you very much, uh, Chancellor. We shall now move to uh, the first uh, presentation and uh, sharing of experience. Uh, our next, uh, our first speaker is Dr. Edison Fermin. Dr. Edison uh, Fermin is the Vice President for Academic Affairs of National Teachers College. He also co-chairs the CHED Technical Panel on Teacher Education and former Director for Innovations Development of Miriam College. He graduated magna cum laude at UP Diliman College of Education. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Edison Fermin. Isang mapagpala at mapagpalayang hapon po sa ating lahat. I'd like to thank the team of uh, Sir Dong for staging this webinar, which is very much needed for all those people engaged in the continuing transformation of higher education relative to the ongoing pandemic. I'd like to begin by telling you a quick story of what happened with British universities during the time of the Great Plague of London. A young, brilliant graduate education student by the name of Isaac Newton was pursuing his advanced studies in physics and mathematics. Because everyone was compelled to go back to their respective homes and have themselves free of the possibility of being infected, the young Isaac Newton had to abandon the University of Cambridge, not bringing with him too many of his books, his apparatuses, and equipment so that he could continue with the learning process. He only had with him the hope that one day he's going to be back in the university and continue with his studies. But at the time that he was in isolation, just like many of the other people at that time, he managed to look at the experience as his Anus Mirabilis, or the Year of Wonders, where he actually had the chance to observe from outside of the window of his bedchamber how apples were falling off from the tree onto the ground, and after several musings, experimented on how this may be represented mathematically, thus yielding what we call the Principia which became the foundation of all his work in universal gravitation, calculus, kinematics, and even optics. While in isolation, we all learned from the fact that Isaac Newton can very well be our poster boy for education in the quarantine period because he was able to prove three things. Number one, self-paced learning is possible. However, in the current discourse in the Philippine education system, we ask ourselves to, is online learning the only route towards self-paced learning? The answer definitely is no. The second one is experiential learning is self-paced learning. For the most part of the experience of Isaac Newton in isolation, he was able to build on what he is observing, translating that into something that he could experiment on and investigate further within the comforts of his home thereby yielding some thoughtful experience translated into some principles that eventually will become part of what we are studying right now in physics and mathematics. The question is, we don't have full knowledge how Isaac Newton was able to design his own self-paced learning experiences. But what we know is, if we concentrate on meaningful experiences and we make those provisions meaningful to us or every learner, then self-paced learning is indeed possible. Last but not the least, Isaac Newton was able to prove that even if you don't have standard content available at home, if you are just proven a mechanism for structuring experiences, you can continue with self-paced learning. 
So given the nature of these three observations I've made, when we were discussing how education environments have been trying to evolve as a result of adversities, we found these three. Against this, Professor Kevin Carey of Harvard University made a fearless forecast that largely because of these realities, there's actually likelihood that the end of college is possible. Since 2015, I've been following up his studies on predicting how universities and colleges or the entire higher education landscape is technically going to be revamped, reconfigured, and essentially forgotten the way we know about it. The truth of the matter is that Professor Ke uh, Carey uh, predicted that by 2025, the brick and mortar universities and colleges will no longer be around. Well, little did he know that it will take earlier year, an earlier uh, uh, turn out of these events because of the pandemic, we are seeing the end of college as we know it, especially with the rise of what we call the University of Everywhere. Such was the same experience of the National Teachers College recently acquired by Ayala Corporation Education in 2018 in its mission of expanding opportunities to build the nation through education. The National Teachers College was built on nine decades of building the nation as a mission, but it only took us nine days to flexible learning transition because we were caught in the middle of the, first, of the second semester when the pandemic happened. And we needed to take good care of 12,000 students from kindergarten all the way to graduate teacher education, where we have about 2,000 students in graduate teacher education alone, and about 8,000 or 9,000 rather in uh, roughly 9,000 people from basic education all the way to undergraduate education. Our agility to move towards in this direction was premised on what we decided on as our North Star. And when we created at the Academic Council an investigation of what will become our towards to the new normal, we said that we need flexible learning first and foremost. And this is the reason the following week when we implemented this, the Coordinating Council for Private Educational Association had asked us to create an initial draft of what will eventually become two of the CHED advisories on COVID-19, particularly in the management of the continuity of education. In those two documents, we define flexible learning as the design and delivery of entire degree programs, courses within degree programs, or interventions for specific types of students within courses and within degree programs, accounting for the distinctions in terms of pace, place, process, and products of learning. But our major guidance will stem from the fact that we cannot teach the same amount of experience, content, and outcomes in pre-COVID-19 scenarios. And most importantly, we want to promote learner control and customizability. Given this disposition towards flexible learning, we decided that in the immediate transition, we first need to reconfigure how we structure all curricular offerings. Now, across all curricular offerings, just like in pre-COVID-19, we still have the general education courses cluster, prof educational ed clusters, the majors cluster. Then we created a bucket for laboratory courses and the licensure courses cluster. The immediate goal through our system called the Enhanced Sustained Academic Engagement Arrangement, or ISEA, was to enable continuing access to success. And in each bucket, we have faculty members actually coordinating what kind of outcomes or content are shared across X number of subjects, in which case, we simplify the process of acquiring these content and outcomes and some skills even for our laboratory courses cluster. Hence, we were able to create a formula that helps us to maximize the expertise of faculty members and necessarily impacting on the amount of learning outcomes that we need to consider. So since May, when we started our summer offerings, we were able to create the synergy between and among professors to manage five buckets of courses within each degree program. And sometimes even, these buckets are shared across related degree programs. The efficiencies that you create around the curriculum provisions, we managed to assess further and put in how the other student services sector will actually add 
into so that uh, we can enhance the experience of the students if, even if they are working remotely. So from ESEA, we migrated to what we call the Adaptive Community for the Continuity of Education and Student Services, or NTC Access. What does access uh, use as principles relative to the design and management of teaching and learning opportunities? First, we need to shift our attention to a different learning design process. What we first did was to review all the outcomes across degree programs and following the initial advisories of CHED on flexible learning, we decided which outcomes we can forego and which outcomes will necessarily have to stay relative to or in anticipation of the licensure examinations and those things that cannot be done largely because of laboratory-based requirements. And then we decided as well on another dictum we cannot teach the same amount of content. And so we had to teach all our faculty members content generation and curation following the dictum that is an inch long, but a mile deep. We did not issue any textbook anymore. We curated content from a variety of open education resources. Some, at some point, our faculty members were also able to generate teacher-made materials based on the inputs come from our OERs. And finally, the most important ingredient in this design process is that we concentrate on realistic experiences that may be done relative to a specific career track that may be done in the comforts of the home of our students. Now, please take note, our school does not have a learning management system and we're not envisioning that given the shortness of preparation we are going to acquire or procure rather an LMS right now. We realize that in the open education ecosystem, there are a lot of tools and resources that we can actually maximize. So take note, the broader part of this pyramid is that we design experiences more than content. Now, why do we need to rationalize the set of outcomes per degree program? Well, to do that, what we need to understand once again, as I was telling earlier, was to identify the power outcomes. I'll give you an illustration. In teacher education, where I'm heavily engaged, we found out that there are a total of about 72 common outcomes that cut across about uh, 60 of our courses. What we did was to remove the redundancy part and instead just concentrate on the ones that will be necessary for each of the courses in the curriculum. We are covering all the degree programs in teacher education, being the National Teachers College. The next one is we had to ask around what will become more important in the careers of would-be teachers as we anticipate education post COVID-19. So we had to talk to a lot of industry reps in finding out which will actually impact on the skills that we need to teach our graduates. Now, within those nine days that I was telling you, we were able to make decisions on which will be retained in the curriculum for our outcomes. And from there, we made a framework that helped us eventually decide how we will choose the learning delivery format. So again, just a quick recap. We started our journey into flexible learning by first cutting down on the outcomes that are unnecessary and unrealistic at this point by first ensuring that our institutional learning outcomes or priorities, our portrait of our graduate, will remain um, intact. But at the same time, we needed to balance that with what our industry and employability partners have been telling us. For example, we are a partner of the SEDA Hotels Group being part of the Ayala ecosystem. We were trying to find out how the hotels were behaving and what will likely change in the years to come. Largely because of those inputs, you were able to determine which of the learning outcomes in our hotel and tourism management degree program will need to be rationalized further. From here, we managed to discuss at the academic council and in our faculty, uh, faculty groups, our decisions relative to four considerations, the pace, the place, the process, and the product. If we decide to do teacher-led pacing, we will succumb to thinking, are we gonna do synchronous or asynchronous learning? But if we concentrate on self-paced learning, we can help 
move the students from the plane of dependence on the teacher towards full independence or at least some form of guided experience. Of course, residential learning is out of the picture, but we're trying to think of the possibility that in the event that the quarantine mechanisms will be lifted towards the end of the first semester of school year 2020-21, we are going to resort to some form of the blending of residential and distance or remote learning. And under distance or remote learning, we have been thinking about the choices between wired and non-wired options after having learned that 62% of our student population technically do not have access to stable internet. The third is in terms of process. We also looked at existing models uh, internationally and globally for remote, uh, locally for remote learning. Of course, we found the discourse of modular learning to be very much uh, accessible to many students. And so under modular learning, there would, there would be choices between printed and non-printed or digitized materials. But at the same time, you need to account for simulative processes of learning, particularly because many of our courses have built-in laboratory subjects in them. And by laboratory work, we needed to make strong decisions. Are we going to facilitate limited laboratory or job-based learning, if possible, or shall we do full remote simulations? And of course, of course, full remote simulations are difficult for students who don't have access to stable internet because we managed to find out online simulators for each degree program. Some are quite expensive, some are for free, but you know, the principal question of access will prevent students from maximizing the affordances of online facilities. In terms of the products of learning, which we refer to assessment, we are of course uh, torn between still making use of the traditional formative and summative assessments, which we can do manually, or in an automated format, or shall we focus on more non-traditional, reflexive, and uh, authentic assessments in the form of actual performances that they can document on their own, or they can record those performances. In the interest of time, I will just show you on the screen what we researched on as options for wired flexible learning, and we found at least 10. Among these 10, of course, you wanted to have more of asynchronous online learning that is adaptive and most importantly, interactive. So when we studied at the level of our academic council, which of these will fit the needs of our students, if and when they have connectivity structures, there appeared to be three major options. And what we thought of doing was, if there is an option for students with connectivity, there must also be options for those who cannot afford connectivity. So among the non-wired flexible learning options that we were able to research on in so little a time, we found out that the easiest way that we can facilitate the continuity of education is via correspondence learning, which has always been in existence. As early as the 18, 1800s, there has been correspondence models between the Philippine Islands and the United States. And eventually, if you study the ecosystem for correspondence learning of the Pennsylvania State University, you will find out how efficient and effective this system is. Well, for the most part of it, correspondence learning translates to what we call home study courses. We looked at other models, but we don't own a television station or a radio broadcast station. The easiest way to do this is via correspondence learning. Although I must tell you, some of our courses that require laboratory procedures can have what we call deliver on demand or ready to use laboratory kits that can be done at home. Anyway, there are only a few of these courses in the first semester. So largely because of this, we were able to finalize two of the modalities that we're going to use. Actually, they are now in operation. So on the one hand, if you're a student who does not have much of connectivity, but you prefer to use printed modules, you go for correspondence learning. Students will have to uh, take care of making arrangements for accessing the physical materials by way of picking up, by mailing them, or if they prefer the digitized version, we can also do that for them. And then there's the fully online provision. It's a good thing that the, uh, that the Commission on Higher Education gave us some form of flexibility to operate on online learning, uh, given the restrictions of the existing guidelines for distance and open education. So here, 
I'd like to emphasize that in our online learning provisions, because we assume that there's still going to be limited connectivity when all of the Philippines would have transitioned to some form of online learning, we calculated that there will only be a limited number of synchronous sessions during which the teacher and the learners can do some form of updating, kumustahan, and at the same time, finding out how they are progressing in the course of their online modules. So largely because the fact that the students have a choice between these two, thank God, uh, enrollment is good. And hopefully, after the pandemic, we will find out how this can become the new normal in our course offerings. The other matter that I'd like to emphasize is that whether you are in correspondence or online learning, the entire faculty member, uh, faculty rather, have approved and adopted that we cannot do so much of content in remote and flexible learning because it might yield or add to the stress and frustration of students. But does this mean that we are going to lower the quality of engagement of the students? When we were doing iterations of our correspondence and online learning modules, we discovered that indeed, it is not content that will drive the learning outcomes, but indeed, it is the experience. And speaking of the experience, particularly in the assessment component, we realized that the same format of assessing knowledge, skills, and attitudes, which the OBE framework of CHED forwards will no longer be the same. Instead, we thought that we need to maximize the current content and context afforded by the pandemic to move forward no longer to the traditional reading, writing, arithmetic, but to what we call the three new R's of the 21st century, which I actually, looking back, started discussing as early as 2012. And these are reasoning, resilience, and responsibility, which are informed by the transversal skills of creativity, critical thinking, and connectedness or collaboration. Of course, each domain here is where a lot of communication happens as well. Now, let me illustrate to you what we have come up with as terminal assessments for some of the degree programs given the situation. So what I'm gonna show you are prototypes that we have created and which will actually be rolled out and have passed the quality assurance process on what we mean by um, integrative assessments. For our ICT computer science and computer engineering courses, here's an example of what we call by assessing students reasoning. In this particular project-led or project-based orientation, disciplines within the ICT group can decide on having only one terminal assessment for the semester, the competencies of which are based on X number of major courses in ICT that they will be covering. But here, it's a project proposal that they are crafting um, for a particular partner. And it is actually directed towards addressing one of the issues that those um, partners might have relative to the pandemic. Again, as I was saying earlier, we need to maximize the content and context of the pandemic as a way of situating better learning assessments. The second one in teacher education, where resilience is a huge focus. Here, we are asking the students to identify an innovation in learning design and delivery that will be advantageous to learners, parents, teachers, and school leaders because one of the sectors that was caught very much unprepared for the pandemic is the education sector. So we want them to think through how education will be reshaped by this uh, phenomenon. And lastly, if you talk about responsibility, you want to prepare them of what's coming up sooner or later in their respective careers. So for instance, in hotel and tourism and business administration, we are going to teach them business resilience and recovery planning as their terminal assessment for the upcoming semester. Again, by mapping out the learning outcomes and then eventually gluing them or piecing them together towards the greater assessment, uh, assessment context of business resilience and recovery planning, we hope that our would-be graduates in the post-COVID-19 scenario will have more value to the institutions that they are going to be part of. Now, another important dimension of this immediate migration is that we needed to think about how to upskill, reskill, and cross-skill our faculty members. When the quarantine started towards the middle of March, the following week we have started our faculty development sessions that will allow that allowed us to rewire, 
reconfigure and reimagine the way our faculty members will behave in the new normal. In fact, it was so swift, swiftly done because we were caught in the middle of the second semester. So while we are implementing the interim solutions, we were also training our faculty members. Little did we know that such agility will also eventually lead us to having our own faculty members facilitating our new certificate courses that we're now offering to the entire public. And through the Alternative and Lifewide Learning Institute at the National Teachers College or All In, we have already completed certifying around 800 faculty members from all over the country on issues about teaching, learning, and parenting in the new normal. And just for your information, our next cohort is going to begin on July 16th. All of these online trainings for preparing schools for transition, you will find at the National Teachers College official website. Just to let you know, we have figured out that there are 10 important preparatory courses that will matter to every institution. If there is someone from the Bukidnon State University, the Southern Leyte State University, and the Iloilo Science and Technology University in the call, you know what I mean, because a good number of your faculty members have trained with us ahead of the other state universities and colleges. I want to give a special call out to the Iloilo Science and Technology University because a total of 100 of their faculty members have already completed at least two of our certificate courses. These are the courses in flexible learning modalities, teaching using open education resources, alternative laboratory-based and simulation-driven learning, project-based learning, flexible learning modules design, generating and curating content, student wellness programs in flexible learning systems, online learning facilitation, assessment of learning in flexible learning systems, and the loan course designed for parents and managers of parents' engagement, the certificate course in preparing parents for learning from home arrangements. Largely because of this, the response of the National Teachers College was also to create a new pathway for achieving the new qualifications in the new normal. I'd like to end this brief sharing by telling you that adversity does not just build character nor reveal it. Fergus Connolly was very much correct when he said that adversity reveals the character of those around you too. In the process, we were able to find out strong partnerships and linkages with industry practitioners, with state universities, private universities, the policymaking sector, in our humble approach to resolve the issues of the discontinuity of education, we found ourselves impacting on the kind of decision-making of other institutions and their leaders. I hope that this brief sharing has given you an idea that in the battle against COVID-19, particularly with reference to the education sector, we must continue to enable access to success. Maraming salamat po at isang mapagpalang hapon sa ating lahat. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Ed. As always, the, you present with uh, excellence, the hallmark of uh, a UP uh, student and uh, well-trained uh, UP uh, professional. May I uh, ask the uh, audience, the participants, if you have questions, uh, we have uh, the chat box where you can uh, share your questions. But so far, we have no comments. Uh, I just wish to uh, to uh, uh, say that gusto ko yatang mag uh, mag register don sa preparing parents for home learning arrangement, uh, Sir Ed. Siguro I, I'll I'll uh, take note of that. Also. I think my other uh, my other uh, quick question is about how are you able to identify just like uh, DepEd the most essential learning skills in the in the case of DepEd they have the most essential learning competencies you no know? but that can be done later uh, for the uh, for our audience or to our participants uh, Dr. Ed has uh, next meeting so. Uh, I don't know if he can still uh, join us in the Q&A uh, during the open forum. I hope you can uh, still uh, join us, uh, Ed, later. Okay, so thank you very much. We shall Dr. now proceed with the presentation of uh, Dr. Tirso Ronquillo.
He is a licensed ASEAN engineer. He's currently on his second term as president of Batangas State University and currently the president of Philippine Association of State Universities and Colleges. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Tilso Ronquillo. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Of course, to our uh, dynamic chancellor of uh, UP Los Baños, uh, Chancellor Sanchez, and uh, to our friend, Dean Donghamatso, thank you for inviting me. I am very much honored to be with you in your uh, series of webinars. I know that you have a multitude of followers or participants in this webinar. You know, I don't know if uh, we have comfort or discomfort in using this technology. It seems now that we can easily host anything. We can easily call for a meeting. We can easily call for a webinar. Actually, I'm uh, a bit occupied, but when Din Dong Kamatsu invited me, I said yes, because I could have another laptop on my right hand and uh, attend another meeting. So <laughs> this is the uh, advantage that we are now enjoying. Now, uh, your webinar is very timely. What I will be sharing with you is our experiences in state universities and colleges, and also some sharing on how we adapted quickly on this. Uh, then can you plus our uh, few slides? I have prepared the few slides, but this is uh, giving us the uh, landscape of how we do it in state universities and colleges, and maybe some specific example on how we did it at Batanga State University. Okay, so your webinar is themed Reimagining Higher and Graduate Education, Business as Usual or New Normal. Uh, Reimagining, sabi nga nung isang kasama ko, parang hindi niya ma-imagine ano? that now we are at this uh, level or at this situation. Now, uh, on the second slide, uh, Dean, uh, I don't know who is operating here. Uh, just to give you a landscape of our state universities and colleges, uh, we are an association of 112 state universities all over the country, including more than 400 satellite campuses. And uh, this school year, we have a rough uh, a population of 1.3 million. So at the same time, these students are being handled by around uh, 70,000 faculty and staff with 26,000 job orders and contract of service workers, the uh, staff who are supporting us on the administrative works. And uh, we produce around 300,000 graduates uh, every year. So this year we have this more than 300,000 and uh, whose employment also becomes uncertain because of this pandemic. So as we all know, and as was shared, education is really one of the sectors which was badly hit by this pandemic. There is also some uh, talks that uh, education now for those private schools, uh, this is not getting uh, a good uh, business year for them. We understand that. We also have some sharing that uh, they are now experiencing decline in enrollment. Even in state universities, though enrollment or studies is free, we also have a number of students based on our survey who may not be able to pursue their studies this coming semester because of course there's a challenge on getting to school and also a challenge on economics on uh, how to support their other needs. Okay, on the next slide. Uh, next slide, sir.
Okay, so all SUCs uh, were caught also unprepared. So we adapted the alternative flexible learning mode or method for the remainder of the second semester. We adjusted some of our academic policies, even grading system, scholastic standing, even policies on dropping of subjects, even student retention and other considerations were given on thesis and research, even policies on OJT and deadlines and other course requirements were also modified. Good that uh, we are actually affected at the middle of the second semester because this is a good, should we say, preparation for the coming first semester. So this is the time for us to really adjust, to really adapt. And uh, we also, we only have around two months for the preparation or in the preparation for the coming second semester. Okay. What are some adjustments that we do? Uh, Din uh, Dong, who is the uh, operator of our ICT? Uh, can we go to the next slide? Okay, thank you. Also, uh, we need to realign our university budget. As you may know, those who are in government or in public sector, DBM recently promulgated the National Budget Circular 580, which uh, directed all SUCs that the capital outlay, 35% of our capital outlay, will no longer be released. And 10% of our MOE will also be uh, withheld by the government for to support the COVID-19 response. So that is one of the uh, uh, circulars that really affected our SUCs in terms of our budget uh, adjustment. So because of that, we need to go back to our respective board to realign our current budget because we have already budgeted that amount in different item of expenditures on research, on extension, and even instruction, and even ICT and laboratory needs in different state universities. Now, uh, another challenge is preparation for procurement plan of the purchase of the learning management system and other licensed softwares for online teaching and even hardware for e-learning hubs. Of course, not all of our SUCs are prepared or with existing LMS. So that's also a challenge. That's a big challenge among us. And for those with LMS, how about the license softwares? How about the online coursewares that can be facilitated through this LMS? So that is also a challenge that we are now responding to. That's why there's really a need to realign our current university budget. In the next slide, to continue, uh, we need to promulgate policy on hiring of faculty members under online teaching engagement because most of our faculty now will be teaching online, even hiring policy for faculty members, for them to be engaged on an online uh, uh, basis, we need to provide a policy or enabling policy for them to be engaged with us. Another is utilization of automated system for some inter-office transaction, coupled with promulgation on guidelines on efficient small value procurement using or utilizing electronic means. Now, uh, administratively, we are affected in state universities and colleges. Even procurement of those uh, our small value procurement is a challenge that our canvassers cannot now go around the city to look for suppliers. So we need to make it online also. So we need to provide a platform so that these uh, activities will be facilitated online. So that's also a challenge to us. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we need to evaluate the uh, learning management system as a platform and license software for virtual laboratories. You know, a big challenge is there's a lot or there's a, uh, a, there's a number of uh, online resources. Our problem now is not we don't have resources. We have a lot of resources, which is also a concern. How shall we sort those resources? How shall we evaluate those resources? 
So among uh, our university uh, members or among the academic uh, officers of the university, we need to assign somebody or group or committee who should evaluate this multitude or this vast uh, online learning resources. Those that will fit our learning outcomes for different courses or different subjects. Also, we need to do or facilitate massive training of faculty members on the use of ICT-enabled teaching and learning. We all know that our faculty members among our SUCs are not that prepared. We are at a different level of preparedness when it comes to ICT-enabled teaching and learning. So now we are doing massive training of faculty members. So we advise them to enroll in different courses and uh, some other universities are offering it, whether private or even public or state. And some are doing it in our respective universities. We do, uh, uh, for those faculty members with advanced learning on ICT enabled teaching and learning, they are doing the training themselves with the rest of the faculty members in our respective universities. Uh, on screen, we have a number of these uh, LMS. Some of them are online or open source rather, or free. Some of them are proprietary. So now many of us are adopting the uh, uh, online or open source, such as uh, Moodle or Google Classroom or Summer Schoology, while some of us are really evaluating those proprietary elements. Uh, we know that there's a lot of open or uh, yes, open electronic resources, uh, OER. Uh, we are simulating or navigating through MIT open courseware. Some are uh, enrolling on uh, Coursera, also navigating or surfing the Khan Academy resources. Well, there's a lot of this possible uh, sources of open uh, online uh, materials for our faculty, and we are navigating on this. Okay, next slide. In uh, particular, uh, at Batanga State University, we established uh, quickly what we call ELDC, Electronic Learning and Development Center. This is, I think, on the last slide. May we go to the last uh, next slide, sir? Okay, uh, ELDC is uh, the arm of the university in migrating from traditional to online teaching and learning. Yes, we know that uh, many of our students cry for uh, not being connected to the internet. In our survey, we have around 15% of our students uh, who really have problems on the connection to the internet. Now, uh, even uh, we have that majority of students with connection to the internet, they have uh, the faculty who will be handling them should be really trained. And part of this ELDC is the training. There is an assistant head for capacity building and training. If you will, uh, if you may notice in this uh, center, the center is directly attached in our case under the office of the president because they have to be directed quickly in the exigency of time, we need to act fast. That's why at the moment or in the interim period, the center is directly uh, uh, positioned under the office of the president. So it is uh, headed by the center head and it is in close coordination with our vice president for academic affairs. That also includes uh, three sub offices, uh, assistant head for ICT and technical support, assistant head for uh, content development and evaluation, and assistant head for capability building and training. So this center is now busy doing a lot of things simultaneously. So the center is expected to recommend the ICT tools for effective teaching and learning, and simultaneously developing and evaluating those online resources available. If there are online available, the committee will be evaluating them. If it's not available, there, are, there is a committee who will develop uh, such a content. 
And uh, the big task of that center now is on capability building our, uh, the building of the capability capacity of our faculty and staff. And of course, a coordination and monitoring and evaluation is also a big challenge on how we ensure that the, te the teaching and learning is uh, 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 with quality. We need to ensure also quality because students under flexible learning mode will be learning on their own pace. How can we check that the outcomes or learning outcomes for its course is achieved? So there should be a monitoring mechanism on a uh, per department level. So that is now uh, a big challenge uh, in our system. However, we are trying to cope up with this uh, challenge and uh, trying to put in place uh, on some interim capacity, a lot of committees and a lot of offices. This is our experience now in state universities and colleges. Though uh, the big uh, challenge now is not only capability building, but the budget that we are now uh, allocating for this. We experience a cut on this and a big challenge is how to realign our current budget. So these are the things that now uh, challenge among us uh, SUC leaders or managers of uh, HEIs uh, in the country. So that's a simple sharing that I could give you. I, can, uh, I am ready later to uh, answer some of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Runquillo. Uh, you said that we have so many resources. Uh, po yung president. But at the same time, uh, there were resources that were taken back uh, to yes. help in the fight for COVID. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I also took note of the, the innovation that you made, the creation of ELDC, which is uh, in response to uh, uh, the creation of... Uh, uh, in, in response to the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, instructional materials. So thank you very much, uh, sir, uh, for sharing those, uh, those uh, innovation that you have made at uh, Batanga State University. Uh, we shall now move to uh, the presentation of uh, uh, our UPLB uh, deans, uh, uh, including their reactions. Uh, we first start with uh, Professor Rolando T. Bello, the Dean of the College of Public Affairs and Development. Professor Avelio is a postgraduate uh, East-West Fellow at University of Hawaii in uh, Manoa and uh, was the first Dean in 2004 to 2007 of the College of Public Affairs and Development. Uh, dean Avelio, you have the floor now. Uh, you as uh, the co-host. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh... Chancellor um, and Vice Chancellor uh, Portia Rapitan, and good afternoon to Dean Dong. Thank you for arranging this uh, webinar, and uh, good afternoon to everyone who's uh, uh, right now uh, logged in into this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm really excited about what were what were presented by Dr. Fermin and Dr. Tronquillo, and at the same time, I, I think uh, I'm quite overwhelmed with the challenges and the things that we have to do to meet the, the new normal, so to speak. Uh, I'll probably have to uh, just present uh, what we are doing in CIPAP, in the College of Public Affairs and Development, as we move to the new normal. Um, since uh, I guess uh, we we'll leave more time for the question and answer uh, later on. Uh, since there are many participants in this webinar. Uh, for now, uh, we have done uh, some uh, changes in our procurement. Uh, we have requested uh, the Chancellor for approval for more hardware to meet the work from home needs of our faculty and staff. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, although we had uh, some plans before the uh, community quarantine, but everything now is in full blast. So we'll be equipping uh, our faculty with uh, new hardware to be able to meet the uh, work from home arrangements. And then uh, 
initially also before the lockdown, uh, we were planning to digitize our library resources. Uh, as you know, our programs are, have been traditional. Uh, we have the community development programs and the extension education programs, as well as the agricultural education programs, uh, which uh, has celebrated its 100th year last year. And also our, our library has the most extensive collection uh, for agrarian studies and research uh, all, uh, nationwide. And then uh, for now, uh, we're uh, moving to the capacity building for remote learning for our faculty and staff. Uh, of course, uh, with uh, what Dr. Fermin uh, has said, uh, the need for upskilling, rescaling and cross-skilling of our faculty. And that uh, presents a huge challenge for us. Uh, but I think uh, we can meet on the, those challenges. And of course, uh, as the Dr. Uh, Porsche Lapitan mentioned before, uh, we're in the process of redesigning our course syllabi and putting up the en enabling environment for our uh, learning resources that will be needed uh, to come up with uh, our new uh, uh, learning uh, material for uh, the next uh, few years. Uh, also, uh, before that, uh, we have tried to acquire uh, software needed for policy studies and policy research. And I think uh, given the uh, current situation uh, where field surveys will be quite difficult, uh, we'll now be moving more into policy simulations and uh, policy modeling. Uh, to uh, come up with uh, recommendations uh, that will be needed to uh, adapt to the new normal. And I'd like to also to uh, inform everyone that we'll be soon coming up with a series of webinars, uh, inviting um, select uh, LGU executives uh, to uh, share their LGU experiences during the uh, community quarantine. Uh, initially, we had uh, Mayor B. Kosoto, uh, but he, we just have to reschedule his webinar. Uh, so we'll be having uh, Mayor Rex Gatchalian of Valenzuela City together with our alumni, uh, Mayor Arlene Arcilias of Santa Rosa City as our first uh, resource persons uh, in the seminars. Uh, and we'll have uh, later on uh, Mayor B. Kosoto and uh, our, also our alumni, Mayor uh, of Kabuyao City. So uh, these are some of the uh, innovations that we are trying to uh, get into uh, into the college from the College of Public Affairs and Development. So with the support of the Chancellor, I think uh, we can uh, really, uh, push with these uh, initiatives. And uh, thank you, Chancellor. Uh, so just uh, I know I was just wondering. I'm probably a question to. Uh, President uh, Ronquillo, uh, sir, um, I really admire your uh, efforts to meet the challenges uh, despite the uh, decreased budgets or this decreased resources. I was just wondering how are your faculty and uh, staff students receiving uh, all, or adapting to this new normal? Uh, how, how are they? Uh, trying to uh, adjust to this kind of uh, challenges. Uh, Dr. Ronquillo, if okay, you sir. can uh, uh, make a re response to the question. Uh, as of now, or what we have just done is really to analyze our budget. We call the executive committee and our finance team to recast our current budget. You know, we were caught uh, uh, by March. We were caught last March. so. The budget from March to December were analyzed and were recasted. Now our board is about to approve it and good that we have some projects which are really not urgent. So we channel those funds for the procurement of this ICT related equipment. So based on our, uh, based on our assessment, initially no, we were able to pull up around uh, 60 million. 
for the procurement of these uh, ICT-enabled uh, teaching devices and even the procurement of the uh, services of uh, uh, internet. So these are being done simultaneously. Of course, part of the DBM uh, NBC 580 is we are restricted to higher job orders. Mm -hmm. So we, we reduce them to one half our uh, job orders in compliance with this uh, DBM circular. And actually the big challenge is to prioritize. We really need to sacrifice somewhere just to give way for the current demand of the times to provide an ICT enabled learning environment. At the same time, we are talking to different telcos, telecom uh, companies. Who among them, who among you can provide the best package for our students? Mm -hmm. Of course, we cannot give laptop, we cannot give tablet to our students. So we are the, uh, arranging bundles to this telco. Who among you can provide the least cost for a very friendly, should I, I say, uh, price per month? Let's say one gigabyte per day, how much would it cost you if our students will be acquiring this uh, uh, with free tablets? So the, the, the different telcos have different offers. We are now analyzing them. We are also talking with the parents. And at the same time, the challenge is our integrated school. Our, we also have uh, elementary and high school. We even arrange for a discount for them because we know that higher education are free, but our <coughs> integrated school, they are paying their tuition fee. So again, we recast and we give a discount for these uh, students. Of course, we, we have sacrificed some of our uh, projects just for this. So those are the challenges that we are now doing. And uh, we are happy that still we can, uh, we can maneuver our, uh, our uh, management or our administration within some uh, fiscal uh, 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 elbow room that we still have in the university. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Runtilio. Uh, if Dr. Fermin is uh, still around uh, and also for Dr. Runtilio, I wish to ask later in the Q&A, uh, what is the most uh, painful from Q&A, Miss Universo Ito? Uh, the most painful, uh, difficult uh, transitions that you had. Sir, but uh, that, please, if you can reserve your uh, answer uh, later in the Q&A. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay. So because uh, our next uh, reaction would come from, or the next presentation would come from uh, Dean Arnold Elipano, who is... Uh, the Dean of the College of uh, Agro-Industrial Engineering and Technology, and currently uh, Program Leader of the DOST Engineering Research and Development for Technology, or ERDT, of the Department of Science and Technology. Dean Arnold? Dean Arnold. Uh, you have the floor now, Dean Arnold. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh... Let, let me just, uh, I, I can't seem to, your, your, my, my, uh, we can see your screen, say that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, good afternoon uh, to about 240 participants, no? Uh, I, what what I'm going to, I'd like to share with the group uh, are some of my notes and uh, well, what we are doing in the college. But basically what we are doing in the college uh, is basically that of what Dean uh, Roland Bello mentioned because uh, those uh, activities are being uh, provided for by UP, UPLB uh, administration in, in general. So I, I, I lost my materials. Sorry, I'm having problem with my... Okay, so I'm back. Yeah, you're back. Uh, yeah, but uh, I just like to add that uh, some of our faculty in the college 
are busy with our committee on uh, technology and facility innovation uh, under the COVID uh, task force uh, formed by oh, wala po yung aking ano, eh, formed by the chancellor no? and uh, And so let me just, uh, this presentation basically benchmarks some of the, the things that other, other universities are doing. No? Uh, and uh, my sources are the Inside Higher Education and Tomorrow's Professor. And uh, basically the, the issue is, uh, this is really an uncertain time. Uh, it's very difficult to predict what will happen in the next uh, short term or even long term. So, so it, it's it's very difficult to move, no? And uh, th there are even issues uh, wherein uh, changes will be sort of permanent. But but basically, and I'll I'll move ahead. Uh, this is something I'd like to share with you. Uh, this is not Philippine setting, but uh, we'll, in, in the college, we'll, oops, we are doing uh, our own uh, survey to, to look at things uh, related to, to this one. Basically, the issue is uh, we, we also look we also need to look at the mental health of our students and uh, the attrition, uh, equity gaps in higher education, particularly those uh, who does not have the internet connections. They also have uh, had some survey of students and uh, these are some of the choices, no? And you'll notice that 78% of students really want, want to get back in person in, in, the, in, the, in campus. Uh, flexible block schedule, this means that, you know, uh, maybe divide the semesters into two, three, and then uh, people will come and go and uh, you, you have less students in, in campus. Simultaneous in-person and online, you have structured gap year, uh, uh, oops, sorry, I'm having problem with my uh, connection. Okay, lang din so just, we can see it. Okay. Then you have uh, court classes on campus, others online, uh, first year in campus, upper years online. And uh, you, you'll notice that those who would like online classes is only 29% of the students. So, so this is something I, I think we need to really look at. Uh, delay of start of semester, 12% only likes uh, that to happen. So, so I, I, I think given uh, the data and, and if we benchmark this with our own students, then we'll probably have some appropriate uh, action uh, related to this. No? Some of the other issues, and, and this is my last slide actually, some of the issues that uh, uh, I think we need to look at is campus life. Uh, if and when they come back, uh, they probably need, of course, the campus uh, uh, housing, social events, athletics, and arts. No? Uh, some issues in the remote instruction, and uh, we'll probably ask this to some of our panelists: is how do you how do you check on your uh, cheating during uh, during uh, in in remote learning? Mm -hmm. Of course, there are other third party. Uh, Sorry. Uh, That's okay, uh, Dinardo. You are uh, doing fine. Uh, about the issues. Uh, okay, that's that's that's. Like, let me just uh, have that one. Uh huh.
you're doing fine, Dean Arnold. Uh, uh, this is the last slide, okay. Yeah. And then do we, do we check our students for COVID? And what is uh -huh. the liability if we reopen campus and students get sick? Uh -huh. uh, the the university uh, stopped tra international travel, so I'm not really sure about uh, how our student, international students can go back. And uh, our employers, and, and we have a strong academic industry linkage in the college, is uh, being jeopardized also because uh, we don't know what will happen to our employers, uh, the, the private sector partnership. And uh, as mentioned by our panelists, uh, our education budget is uh, being uh, reduced. And, uh, and all uh, the other activities require the budget, of course. So yeah. I, I think I just stopped there. No? Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll check and uh, maybe I, I, I can... Uh, present it uh, later if there's so, some questions. I think, uh, Dean Arnold, you pose important uh, issues about, uh, uh, for instance, you uh, mentioned about uh, that 78% of students wants to have a face-to-face. -face. I, I would like to relate this with what Dr. Fermin mentioned earlier, that walang uh, makaka-replace experience uh, in campus, a uh, classroom experience. So. The challenge now is for us to to really uh, you know uh, transition from from a face to face uh, in class to a remote uh, online or flexible learning uh, experience. Uh, I, I think there are other uh, important issues that you mentioned: the cheating. Uh, in the other uh, webinars we had, uh, nasagut ito. Uh, but uh, I'm sure our uh, panel members can also share their experience. Even the employer's uh, expectation about the quality of graduates in time of in this time of global pandemic. Uh, so, marami po tayong mga kinakaharap na issue uh, ngayong panahon ng pandemya, lalong lalo na sa higher and graduate education. Uh, the uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Elipano mentioned about uh, the testing of international students. Uh, Doon po sa mga pinapadala nating pa ng mga international students, uh, hindi po required ang, ang testing. Uh, ang requirement po sa kanila ay ang medical or health, health certification ng university health uh, service before they travel back home. So uh, I think uh, uh, even uh, Professor Bellio mentioned about the upskilling, the reskilling, and the cross-skilling of our faculty members. At ito po yung mga napapanahon na ginagawa ng ating mga faculty uh, members. Uh, but truly the challenge is, you know, the, that uh, real experience to, uh, to experience all this uh, uh, hands-on training, this training that our university uh, is uh, offering. So we shall now move to uh, the third uh, Panel member, uh, Dean Willie P. Abasolo, uh, the Dean of the College of Forestry and Natural Resources. He is uh, the NAS, he's a NAS outstanding young scientist and holds a UP scientist rank. And last week he just celebrated his 51st birthday. Uh, Dean Abasolo. <laughs> so please, uh, uh, Dean Abasolo, what's yours? Good afternoon to everyone. Nakasama pa yung anena. Pinadala ko yung ano, food panda sa inyo. Natanggap nyo ba? <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. So, good afternoon. So, it's my pleasure and being uh, thankful to Dean Dong for inviting me you know, to share the experience of the college during this COVID pandemic. Uh, and then, um, so, more or less, uh, we, Dr. Bellio and of course, uh, uh, Prof. Bellio and Dr. Elipano has mentioned all the difficulties of uh, this pandemic that has brought to our colleges. But maybe just to give you an first, I would like just to inform you, the, for example, with regards to the students. So we conducted a student survey regarding their accessibility to the internet. 
And uh, I'm I'm happy to note that uh, it's our student, uh, 91.5% of our student has internet access. However, this internet access is due to the fact that uh, they are in, still in the university. But when once they uh, go went back, went back to their own uh, provinces, uh, I definitely that this will change because more mostly they uh, rely on the campus Wi-Fi. So, and uh, so that's one of our major challenge actually now that uh, uh, we the how we can you know provide the students with the the instructions. That's why in our last Exico meeting, uh, the, we uh, decided actually to combine again online learning as well as the correspondence learning. For students who have access, we can uh, deliver the courses online. But for those who are uh, have no access and then and, and living in uh, remote areas, well, most probably we will provide them with the instruction using the correspondence mode. And uh, sad to say that in the college, uh, we have the maybe the poorest of the poor among the students. And that's why I, 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 I'm expecting that uh, maybe around 50% of the students would be, would rely on this correspondence learning later on. Uh, nonetheless, of course, uh, this is the challenge we have to face. And in addition, the we have changed already the curricula as well. Most of our courses is basically applied, basically be, uh, more or less a practical learning, uh, identification. Uh, it's more of the experiential learning, which is, uh, as Dr. Camacho have said, it's, more, it's very difficult to replace, uh, especially during uh, one of our course is what we call dendrology, which, you know, uh, uh, train the student to identify uh, plants of different kinds using the leaves in the bark. So how can we, you know, and it's more or less almost field work. So that's one challenge that uh, how we're going to provide the appropriate learning experience for them if it would be online. A uh, good thing that the our department has you know, revised the curricula and the mode and then uh, in changing the the, the focus of the course instead of experiential we would now uh, we would now focus on the basically on the content uh, so it's a different thing it's a different thing that uh, the uh, one, one of our panelists has, has mentioned before that uh, they are now focusing on the uh, reducing the content but most on, on the experience but for us it's the other way around because uh, we cannot do we cannot really provide the best experience for the students during this time, especially that the uh, the most of the uh, samples or the three samples, the plant samples that we have, uh, uh, the most of the samples come from this, uh, the Mount Makiling Forest Reserve. So if they are in an, a different province, they don't have any access. So that's one thing that we have to, that we are now considering. So uh, we'll concentrate on the basic, on the, on the theories and not more on the practical side. And so uh, there's as well as there were most of the courses that we have here are more of uh, laboratory works. That's that's one big challenge for us. Maybe not only for the College of Forestry, but also for, for the whole you know, course, courses that are, you know, biological subjects, you know, that would really require laboratory work, experiments, chemicals, um, so this is uh, these are challenges that um, I uh, um, I'm sad to say that as of now until now you know, the, the college is finding it hard to really uh, find solutions. But of course, uh, what we did in the beginning of the COVID was to reduce the uh, you know just provide the basic uh, competence that the student would need, and then. Uh, so that's why our fear before was that uh, maybe the quality would differ, especially that the you know the, the the practical side of the course is very limited, very limited this time, uh, and that's why I've been you know uh, talking to the uh, board of foresters to 
maybe there would need there there will be a need to really change the the way we give exams during the board exam because it's it's a totally different ball game now and um and but of course you know with the we have to adapt and uh, this is uh, you said that this is the new normal that we have to face but um so with regards to the students uh, i think uh, you know it's a big 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 challenge for us but the faculty on, uh, on the, the faculty side they are adapting and then they're modifying all the courses they have submitted all the the revised courses to me uh, however you know the still the implementation the application would be a different thing but anyways uh, this is the new normal and uh, it's still a learning uh, learning experience for all of us here in the college uh, and most especially for for those who have you know the, are those are senior senior faculties that uh, maybe they need to have you know retooling retooling in, in, in terms of uh, uh, offering their programs or their courses online and uh, that's why I'm encouraged they are I encourage them to attend all of these webinars especially the ones offered by the uh, uh, the of uh, Open Campus, op uh, Open University, I'm sorry, and then the LTE coming from, uh, so because we have to really retool ourselves to to adapt to this new new scenario that uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, at, by the end of the first semester of this school year, it would be, it would be different during the second semester. And one more challenging, uh, maybe one experience also that uh, I can share is uh, regarding the off-campus mode with regards to the graduate graduate courses that we offer. Uh, the bachelor, you know, uh, we we just or more or less uh, that's we can we're now doing our best to you know modify the things there. But uh, in the graduate courses, I think it's more flexible for us. It's because of the students, uh, the nature of the students. And uh, well, however, the most difficult thing about the graduate courses is the thesis itself, because they really need to do laboratory experiments. Uh, they really need to get uh, first uh, first hand information, you know, not secondary data. Uh, so that's all. Um, that's maybe another adjustment that we need to do in the College of Forest. So I think that's that's all. And if you have any questions later on, you know, I can uh, easily yeah. answer the questions. Thank you, later. Dina Basolo. Just a quick question. Uh, I know you have one of the best buses in UPLB now. Sir, yung pong correspondence mode. So you have plan to you have plan to uh, uh, do learning through the correspondence mode. Because this was also asked during the presentation of Dean Terol, uh, for instance, uh, who will shoulder the cost of uh, sending materials to the students? Uh, if you can reserve uh, your answers uh, later, but uh, anyway, okay, mamaya po natin tanungin. Because uh, the next presentation or reaction would come from the Dean of the School of Environmental Science and Management who also holds a UP scientist rank for her research and scientific productivity. And most recently, she is recipient of the National Research Council of the Philippines uh, Outstanding Researcher Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Dean Decibel Eslava. Thank you, Dean. Dean Thank you, Podding Dong. So I'd like to share a few slides and interject it with uh, my reactions to the earlier presentation spot. And so um, the these are my some of my thoughts and those of colleagues from SESAM. So what is our prognosis and um, strategies that we can use to cope with the new things that are all going on around us? So. Um, Okay. So uh, just to uh, orient uh, colleagues who are with us today, SESAM, or the School of Environmental Science and Management, is a graduate school. Mm -hmm. 
offer uh, graduate programs in environmental science, uh, residential off campus and PhD by research. And we are also part of the institutions that offer the professional masters in tropical marine ecosystems management, which is offered in a modular uh, basis. So um, SARS-CoV versus graduate school education, I think will be fine. Um, graduate education will continue, but of course there are challenges, but there are also numerous opportunities that opened up. However, we'll have to address um, those challenges. For example, um, like most other colleges uh, in UPLB, the first thing that we did upon instruction of uh, OVCAA, uh, Vice Portia and Chancellor Dindo was to do a survey on the uh, access of our students to the internet. And we found that about 25% of our graduate students uh, from SESAM do not have reliable internet access. And even 1% of them do not own laptops. So can you imagine that? Meron pa palang graduate students na walang sariling computers. <laughs> but uh, we're not uh, you know, losing heart because we know that whenever something changes, Merong nag occupy na bago doon sa na, 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 na vacate na, na, na niche. For example, uh, when the Black Death in the Middle Ages occurred, there was a major shift in thinking from one that centers on theology, that one that values sciences more. And in, the, in 2003, 2004, when SARS occurred, there was a massive decline in higher education enrollment, even in graduate school enrollment. But uh, it took two years for the system to recover. So, nagre recover, but it's going to take some time. What uh, we saw with SARS CoV 2 now is that it exposed a lot of the weak points of our um, graduate school system. For example, um, we may have to look at the admission and registration procedures. Are we being too rigid? Because um, at this point in time, when we're supposed to be receiving something like 40 plus applications, we're not reaching that number. And of course, that's understandable. A lot of people lost jobs and um, would have to think about you know, stability in the next few months. So graduate schooling may not be in their minds at this point. Um, are we also graduating our students too, too, too slowly? So marami bang natrap na andito pa din, di pa rin graduate. Are we supposed to move them faster? Uh, we have actually moved them faster, but do we need to move them even more faster than what we are doing now? And of obviously, one of the failings that uh, was, you know, uh, exposed is, our insufficient digital infrastructure. And however, all the changes that are going on is forcing us to shift to other modes of teaching. And the modes that are being offered to us are complicated. They're, um, for some people, for technologically challenged people, the modes, the new modes are labor intensive. And for administrators, it's kind of difficult to monitor, but those are necessary changes. So um, remote learning is not just about creating videos of our lectures. It is actually about reconfiguring our relationship with our students. It's about teaching in a new way. It's about mentoring in a new way. So um, one of the other things that we also have to look into are curricular adjustments. Do we need to reprogram our courses, redesign our program? And of course, looking into various modes, do we go more into the modular method of teaching? Because at this point, uh, for a graduate student, the full load is about 12 units. So that means four courses. And four courses altogether that you would have to attend, say, um, uh, remotely or synchronously with uh, your other classmates. Would might, might be difficult for some people. So do we start to offer in a more modular mode or is correspondence uh, teaching better at this point? And of course, you'll have to look into loading. Um, some, there are some suggestions of deloading our students. Um, instead of 12 units for graduate students, do we bring them down to nine? And does that mean we also bring down our faculty loads? So I do not have answers for you at this point because these are very fluid questions and issues at this time and we're still uh, discussing this. 
But uh, whatever, wherever the discussion goes, we have to keep with our principles in teaching. And that one of which is reciprocity. So whatever we give out, we have to be ready to take also. So we have to have open lines with our students so that we are able to give, to, to collect feedbacks from them. And in question earlier, how do you administer exams without by, and make sure that students are not cheating? So this is part of expecting excellence from them despite the challenges. And this includes high moral standards, expecting high moral standards from them. Of course, inclusivity and flexibility. Um, some of the things that we have been discussing among ourselves is, our, is, are we going to adjust costing? Because obviously we're not having physical classes at this time. We're, lessing, we're using less utilities, but we are investing more in other things. A lot of our faculty members had to buy new gadgets and of course had to subscribe to better internet connection. And what about scholarships? We're having um, some issues with students wanting to apply to, for scholarships because we are not sure about how they would be able to comply with the load requirement, among other things. And, but some of the things that we, the, the beautiful things that we can ponder on is that if we are going to move towards a remote Edu uh, uh, remote education base or by correspondence or by online teaching, we are going to expand our student base. But if we're going to do that, then where's the line between having online students and residential students? But of course, it's a beautiful problem because we can have students from anywhere in the world. But it brings to question the need for our off-campus programs. And SESAM has been very proud of our off-campus program in Mindanao. So do we change that? Do we change its definition? And then, of course, other options that we have to think about are for our lab and field-based classes. And this has been brought up several times. Um, do we identify safe groups and communities instead where our students can go or and do their uh, experiments? Or do we ask them to stay in a dormitory for 14 days and quarantine before they can all come together and do the lab work? So is there a quarantine protocol prior to enrollment? And then there are other realities on the ground. Nakawawa yung walang kakayahan, which is true. We cannot offer to buy laptops for all of our students, which is why I am very impressed with the move by um, residents from Kilio, this, um, the massive discounts for students and faculty members, and not just for the equipment, but also for internet access. I, I think that's a very bright idea, and I think other institutions should follow suit. Uh, the other things that uh, we might have to think about is um, cross-crediting should universities start to collaborate on cross-crediting -credit and course cert certifications. Uh, other opportunities for wider faculty collaboration also now exist. Uh, we can have more faculty members team teaching or relay teaching, especially partnering uh, faculty members who are very good with technology with those who are not so you know, uh, good with technology. And then also look at various modes of materials dissemination, synchronous, asynchronous. And of, but we might have to think about uh, protection of our IP materials. Kasi ngayon nga na hindi pa tayo full online yung materials na pinamimigay natin sa students kung saan saan umaabot. So what more when we go online? And then of course there are other opportunities for businesses, but I won't go into that. But so for SESAM, one of the things that we started to do, that we first did was, of course, to do the survey on our students. And the second part, the syllabus revision, was the more difficult part. Uh, we were asked to uh, adjust our um, syllabus to the minimum competencies required for students to pass the course. And you know how it is. You are all teachers. Nagkaroon ng sepanks yung maraming tao, separation anxiety, on ano ba yung usual na in-expect nila from their students at ano ngayon yung bagong hinihingi to reduce to minimum competency. So that is one of the more difficult part when we were starting with this. And 
Of course, we prepared and are still preparing ourselves for new ways of teaching. And we're doing that by discussing among ourselves. We even had a show and tell workshop. We asked uh, one faculty member who was very good at creating videos to come and teach us. So it was one whole half afternoon doing that. We're still preparing materials. We prepared some, but we're still preparing materials for remote learning and even uh, doing um, saving materials in USBs parang sa correspondence education. So uh, may mga students who do not have good internet access. So we had to collate and save the materials in USBs and send them out the USBs. And then they had to return their outputs via ano rin, snail mail, ipapackage then. So at this time, we're not teaching about sino ang gagastos sa ano because these are still very small expenses. But when we do this on a regular basis, we really have to consider such expenses. And of course, we're now crafting the bridging programs, redesigning our courses for the next semester and how we're going to deliver it. But more importantly, we're building up peer support, uh, peer support among us faculty members and between our students and the feedback system. So um, we're all new to this. This Everything that's going on is very new to all of us. Hindi lang sa estudyante natin. So important that we get feedback from our colleagues and feedback from our students kung effective ba, hindi ba effective, kung masyadong stringent or not. So we need the feedback system. So we do not have maps for this. This is a new territory and we have a very big chance of getting lost in all of this. But uh, wherever we go, kung saan man magtungo yung kalsada na yon, it's going to open up new trails. So we are retooling, relearning, redesigning. And, uh, and I appreciate these webinars that the GS has uh, been organizing because we have been learning from each other. And uh, we're stealing our hearts and guts and convincing ourselves that we can do this. And we really have no other option but to do this because diba, sabi nga ni Darwin, rephrase, it's not the strongest of the species that survives. It's the most adaptable. So we really have to learn how to adapt. So maraming salamat sa talks nila, Dr. Fermin and uh, President Ronquillo. We learned a lot from you. And uh, let's keep doing this. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dinde. I like the last slide that you have shown. Uh, your most adaptable. It's not the strongest of the species that survive. It's the most adaptable. I think uh, yan ang sang keyword ngayon. How do we adapt with the new normal? Thank you very much. Uh, and also the questions and opportunities for collaboration with the industry. I took note of that. Uh, but we can again uh, reopen uh, the important questions and issues that you have forwarded in this webinar. These are very important, I think, uh, Dinde. Uh, for us to rethink in adapting to the new normal. And especially in your last slide, sabi mo nga eh, the three R's, I think this is also the three R's. I'm not sure if the same three R's that was shared by Dr. Fermin, but in your three R's, the retooling, relearning, redesigning, these are very important. And we'll be ending up in new trails anyway. So we might as well, you know, uh, uh, wala tayong mga mapa, we might come up with a new territory and therefore the chance of getting lost. Thank you very much for those inspiring words, uh, Dinde. And to our uh, three deans, uh, Dr. Uh, Elipano, Dr. Abasolo, and Prof. Uh, Bellio, uh, you have made, uh, you have shown us the preparations that you are doing in your own colleges for your students, for your faculty, and uh, for your uh, staff. Now, I've seen uh, questions, couple of questions, and there's still uh, questions uh, being flashed in the chat box. But just to acknowledge the question, the first is the whether uh, which is more asynchronous, which is more effective, asynchronous or uh, synchronous uh, uh, approach. If Dr. Fermin is uh, still uh, uh, with us, uh, he might share his uh, experience, uh, but. Uh, any member of the panel can, uh, can uh, share their uh, experience. Uh, the next is uh, about question about uh, uh, is uh, digital infrastructure in digit, the insufficiency of digital infrastructure in this day of uh, the global uh, uh, pandemic. 
the insufficiency of digital infrastructure. Uh, we took note of that. Uh, the migration of our learning management system to a new system, if any uh, of our panelists uh, can re react to this, uh, how can we easily transition to a new LMS? Uh, I already answered about the online payment. Uh, we, are, we, are, we also do online bank-to-bank uh, -bank transfer of our admission fees, for instance. But there's one question by Anna Fermalino. If the university can adopt, I think uh, this was aired by uh, Dean Day, about the modular approach to our delivery of our off-campus program. Uh, I think our vice chancellor uh, uh, is listening. And if any mem uh, one member of the panel can respond to this. And in fact, uh, Dr. Jane Reyes made a comment about uh, how the Odell uh, might work in this uh, 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 learning approach. So, uh, yes, uh, Din Dong. Yes, ma'am, please, uh, ma yeah. Vice Chancellor Lapitan. In the chat, I already responded you know, to the questions and uh, concerns raised you know, by uh, a number of our participants. And I said there in my chat that very soon, yeah. in fact, maybe this afternoon, a memo on remote delivery for uh, the first semester 2020-2021 will come out from the Office of the Vice President for Academic Affairs that all the concerns that surface in the chat, you know, whether we will be teaching modular, whether, whether we will be uh, concentrating half of the courses for the semester to be uh, focused on the first half of the semester and then the rest, all of this will be clarified and will be addressed. Mm -hmm. Even the concern, for example, that Dean Day uh, uh, voiced out, for example, about subsidy for uh, faculty members and students so that they can have the necessary access to the remote delivery. All of this will be part you know, of that memo that will come out. Mm -hmm. In fact, that memo uh, will be discussed um, initially with the members of the executive committee tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We will have an executive uh, committee meeting as uh, uh, was this scheduled by the chancellor tomorrow to discuss these concerns and thereafter there will be some kind of a leveling off uh, among you know um, deans unit heads and administrators on how we will be addressing you now we will be addressing the challenges the concerns of uh, the first semester 2020 2021 delivery of uh, courses Thank you uh, very much, uh, Vice Chancellor Lapitan, for uh, clarifying uh, with our uh, co-faculty members about the initiatives of the university. Uh, in the last uh, five minutes or so, uh, we can, uh, before, uh, we still have questions here, but in the, because we have limited uh, time, we need to uh, conclude by 4 p.m. But if Dr. Ronquillo is around, uh, if uh, he can share uh, some final thoughts. And Dr. Fermin, I'm not sure if Dr. Fermin uh, went to his next meeting before we ask uh, our uh, chancellor uh, to make some uh, you know, brief remarks about uh, the preparations of the university. Also uh, in support of Vice Chancellor uh, Lapitan. Dr. Ronquillo? Okay, uh, Dean Camacho, I'm still here. Yes, I was listening to some of the presentations here. Okay, so uh, the challenge that we are now in is, or the problem is, we always compare the old and the new. That's our uh, concern now, or that's our problem. Kinukumpara po kasi ng mga teacher, paano kaya ngayon? Eh, hindi natin magagawa yung dati natin ginagawa. Eh, dapat nating malaman na hindi talaga yan pareho. Hindi talaga kayang i-equate ang face-to-face -face ng online. Kaya we should rewire, we should rethink on how we can still achieve the outcome with this current technology, with this current delivery. Kaya nga ang discussion lagi is papuntang outcome. It's more of the outcome. How can you still achieve the outcome with this mode of delivery? Our teachers always have the tendency to compare. How about the exam now? They might cheat. So you should give exam which 
even though they will look for the notes or any material, still you can get the outcome. So I, I, I would love to share that, uh, that insight that we should not compare the old and the new. So our university uh, released our internal policy immediately last April on, let's say for example, even the teachers should also declare the teaching and learning engagement. It has to be approved by the department. For those with uh, sufficient internet connection or adequate bandwidth, what should be the, the materials and how should be the engagement of the teachers? For those without uh, internet connection, what should be the engagement? There is so-called teaching and learning engagement form that should be filled in by the teachers and should be uh, monitored by the department chair. So that is one way to, to achieve. But you know, in the Philippines, we need to have these things present first. Don't look at the performance yet. I know it's not, uh, should I say, not that 100% sound, I know. But this has to be present. Dapat meron tayong ganito. Di ba ang sabi ng iba, hindi naman po yan effective. We know that. Kasi matagal na pong ilang dekada na ang usapan na online sa ibang lugar ginagawa na nila at ang dami ng usapan sa mga conferences that still is not 100% effective. Yes, we believe on that po. But before, parang kumbaga sa artista, presence muna bago performance. You cannot perform well if you are not there. So this enabling environment should be present first before we can tackle the issue on absolute 100% performance. Okay, on that note, at Batangas State University, we are still maneuvering we are still making this enabling environment present and fiscally we are managing so that our faculty kasi laging ipupukol lang faculty wala kami nito dapat present ito wala kaming online lab so kapag po nangyari na yan iba naman ang magiging issue i know there is another issue but we will we will address things blow by blow face by face because we are still adjusting all of us wala naman pong prepare sa atin even yung ibang advanced countries ay hindi rin po prepare. So this is our experience. Kaya po ang sinasabi ko lagi, malaki po ang role ng teachers dito. Teachers will really be facilitators. It's not of the content now. It's the context. It's the outcome. Teachers will connect the dots. Sobrang parenting. So hindi lang po teaching eh. Pati parenting. Ang, yan ang role ng teachers ngayon. Kaya huwag nating ipilit yung ating content noon. Eh, dapat ay eh, yun din ang content ngayon. So I know that our teachers should be, should be the ones responsible. We should act as mothers. We should connect the dots. We should really care for our students. We should be the great facilitators in our vast classroom. Thank you very much, Paul. Ay po salamat, uh, Dr. Uh, Ron Quilio. Uh, is uh, Ed uh, still around, is still with us? Ed? Okay, so nasa isang meeting na siya. But ma, may we have the last uh, message or the last comment. Uh, we save the last, uh, the best for the last. Uh, our chancellor, chancellor, uh, some final I, comments before we close, sir. Uh, before I, I start my uh, comment, I just want to congratulate uh, Dean Don Camacho and the team of the Graduate School for holding this webinar, very important webinar, and. Uh, having started the ball rolling. So in, in, in UPLB, definitely we will start yung uh, review of all programs, especially on the infrastructure side, wherein we're going to modify the priorities, especially with the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, for example, we're building our new library, our, uh, our 800 million uh, library Knowledge Center. So we're going to redesign the library based on the experiences of COVID-19, primarily because the ITC and the ILC are integrated in this facility. So definitely we're going to strengthen the capacity of the ITC center, uh, our uh, server, server uh, units, the ILC on how to help us move to online uh, modes and uh, of course, definitely, we need to start a program of leveling off, leveling off in, in the sense that we need to teach our faculty members and of course our students on how to transition to this new normal. And of course, uh, similar to UP Manila, 
who invested on Canvas, UPLB is also looking at Canvas as their as our LMS. So definitely, may leveling up rin yan, may training pa rin tayo we need to do. So a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, patients should be uh, with us kasi hindi pwede mapikon. Mapikon, talo, di ba? So kailangan, uh, we need to have these patients for our students to, to, to learn, both undergraduate and graduate. And of course, para isa pa ta, para pareho tayo nasa isang page where the uh, the office of the chancellor will come out with, of course, with the office of the vice chancellor for academic affairs will come out with a primer on flexible learning. This is ito yung long term, kasi yung short term natin transition is now first semester. But we need to look uh, towards the future. Your education. 4.0 since sabi ko kanina on uh, we need to have a primer on how to lay down or to have that flexible learning uh, protocol uh, done by UPLB so kailangan natin may plano tayo in the long run kasi at the end of the day the COVID-19 pandemic will subside we will have a vaccine and meron tayong uh, uh, pagbabalik sa sa limited face-to-face -face, uh, instruction, especially on uh, our degree programs that have a lot of laboratories. Itong sinasabi ko isang koleyo na to is your College of Veterinary Medicine. So they, they have a lot of laboratories that needs to be addressed face-to-face. -face. But with the new normal, it has to be uh, it has to transition. So, ang design ng curriculum natin has to be uh, done. Redesigning of our uh, degree programs and uh, instructional design has to be done. And of course, uh, based on the UP system, we're going to provide funds. Para i-address yung concern ni Day na oh, sino bang gagasto sa computer? May subsidy po. May bibigay ang uh, university in buying computer. I don't know if it's a 20,000 subsidy or 30,000 peso subsidy in acquiring uh, laptops. Uh, the students, uh, of course we have, but not all students will be provided. Merong pag-aaral, parang yung sa STFAC. So depending on, on the income bracket, if we can provide the, the necessary subsidy. The degree of subsidy will still be studied by a system uh, committee. And of course, kasama rin yung internet subscription for faculty members and of course for students. So on that note, uh, maraming gagawin pero pagsama-sama tayo, nagtutulungan, dong, kaya natin lagpasan lahat ng challenges. And of course, that's, uh, of course, as a national university, the University of Philippines Los Baños has to be part uh, in helping our fellow SUCs in this uh, pandemic also. So, Sir Tirso, tutulong po rin ng UPLB sa mga SUC partners na natin uh, on this uh, addressing the challenges of COVID-19. We're going to share our resources. We're going to share our talents uh, with uh, the SUCs, our sister SUCs in the country. Because together, we can uh, achieve uh, what uh, the impossible thing we can achieve what anything uh, what uh, any, any any challenges so yun po thank you dong and congratulations to uh, the UP graduate school maraming salamat po chancellor sanchez for your commitment to uh, support our SUCs and uh, we do acknowledge your uh, presence and your uh, expression of support maraming salamat po ganun din kay din kaman so salamat po sa inyo Hi, pong sa salamat, uh, Chancellor, uh, for providing us an overview of how do we transition to the new normal. And uh, marami po talagang uh, mga faculty, ang, uh, I would say, uh, siyempre may pag-agam-agam, but with all the things that you have clarified, with all the things that you have said, uh, malaki ang pag-ibsan ng mga 
uh, agam-agam na to. Lalong-lalo na uh, bukas magkakaroon ng Execom meeting. And this, uh, the, I would say, yung pong mga command ninyo, uh, mga ipaparating natin sa mga faculty members natin, ay malaking bagay to serve as a guidepost for us to reach the experience and new normal. And so with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, with uh, about 220, 222, kanina po, mumabot tayo ng 250. Uh, maray pong salamat for uh, joining us uh, in this afternoon's uh, webinar. And uh, we thank the Chancellor for joining us since uh, day one. He's uh, here with us uh, together with the Vice Chancellor. And for today's uh, webinar series, uh, we thank Dr. Ronquillo, President of Batangas State University and the Philippine Association of State Universities and Colleges. Our deans, uh, Dean Slava, magblot ka po, Dean Slava. Dean uh, Arnold, Dean Roland Bellio, and Dean uh, Willie, magboblot ka din kasi birthday mo last week. Maraming pong salamat at uh, padayon, mabuhay po tayong lahat. Maraming pong salamat sa inyong lahat. Salamat po, Sir Ronquillo. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Salamat, right. Sir, salamat for the invitation. Bye. Bye. Bye.